Okay. The next talk is The Other Side of NO, Nitric Oxide in the Infrared by Jeremy Winnick. And here are some of the other people who have helped me out. Since I'm retired, I go back and ask people for what they think is important in the last uh, bit. Let's see if this will get me down. So I'll just briefly talk about how I got to this point, got to these points on doing NO, um, talk about some of the production, but not in too much detail. The talk after me might talk more about that. Um, a long history, as you saw at the beginning of it um, in the previous talk. Um, I think there's still uncertain exact answers about how we get the distribution the right amount, are the, the rate constants correct, and all that stuff. But we're going to be looking at the infrared emission. And the infrared emission uh, turns out to be the main cooling mechanism of the thermosphere above about 120 <coughs> kilometers up to at least 200 or so. Um, Air Force was interested in, for uh, surveillance reasons, also detection of spacecraft, rocket launches, and things like that. Um, and we learned some new things with some interesting experiments that Air Force Research Lab did. So my connection with LAST was I came here and did a postdoc with Ian Stewart after getting my PhD in chemical physics and not doing too much. It was quite esoteric, scattering of positrons and hydrogen. You can't too many applications in the upper atmosphere for that. <laughs> That's part of the reason I decided to move on to something I could visualize better. So we worked on some UV stuff, the SPUV of ozone on Atmospheric Explorer, photochemical modeling of ozone on Mars, and with Larry did uh, photochemical modeling of sulfur dioxide on Venus. No work with nitric oxide. Okay. So then when I went on to AFGL at that point, later became AFRL, first job was to do an aurora chemical model. And of course, one of the main components of that is nitric oxide emission that gets created at the time. Nitric oxide is created by exothermic chemical reactions. And you see emission in delta vehicles one and two. You're going to see more of this on the other slides. But first, talk about some to the UV crowd about IR. I guess maybe a bad, bad thing with IR and SME or something. Um, IR isn't simple and isn't easy to do. I don't know if John Gilley's still here. He knows that too. <laughs> and um, but you can do it day and night. Now, there's a great thing, and people, not what I did, but people I know here are still working with. Um, other people on, um, such as Manuel Lopez Fortes with MEPOS and stuff, if you can measure NO2 and NO in the, in the uh, polar night, you can see this track the source of uh, excitation from particles and that NO coming down into the stratosphere. Um, it's true that IR often has more expensive, complicated instruments. But that shouldn't always discourage you. I've been working on with the Sabre team for a long time, and Sabre is really the only instrument still working on the time satellite. It's going into its 14th year, and it has an electromechanical cryocooler on it. OK, so no one's had these NO jokes, so I thought I had to get at least one. <laughs> now, people say, just say no. When I first got to AFGL, here was the paper I was told to look at. It was the best summary up to that point. And you read it, it says, no infrared radiation in the upper atmosphere. <laughs> Why in the world am I coming to do this? But actually, it was a very good paper. It summarized things up to that time. Now, everyone who's gotten through all this stuff knows about the, the gamma bands the delta bands from these higher electronic states of NO, but we're going to be just, um, we're just going to be worried about all these vibrational levels of the ground state. And um, 
If you're going to model the V equals 1 and higher, you can use just a steady state photochemical model because you always have the radiative lifetime, which is sometimes longer than the quenching lifetime, but it's, it's probably 80 milliseconds or less. Um, and you produce NO by mainly by these two mechanisms, two reactions, the N double being being the major one. This one is actually is slow because there's a large activation energy, but it is exothermic, so it, it, it can occur under other circumstances, and maybe we'll hear some more about that in the next talk. Um, but when you look at NO, you see a, ma a major peak just from 1 to 0, which is dominated by just the collisional terms that's transferring kinetic energy in the atomic oxygen atom into the first vibrational state. And then that radiates at 5.3, which is the fundamental. But as you go higher up in the vibrational level, you actually have a fairly noticeable amount in the delta V equals 2, which kind of goes at 2.7. Thus, if you look at 2.7, you, you should be able to see what's coming from the chemical part as opposed to just the collisional part. They invest, the Air Force and the Defense Nuclear Agency invested a lot of money in trying to measure laboratory rates for such reactions, not just for Aurora, they're probably interested in nuclear excitate, you know, bomb bursts, what happens to your infrared visibility afterwards. This, this apparatus, Cochise for Cold Chemical Infrared Simulation Experiment, is probably two, the outer shell was two meters in diameter, maybe three or more meters in length, pumped down the millitor, cooled at times with helium. And in these experiments, they take microwave discharge, let's say nitrogen and argon in here, flow it in, counterflow O2, and look at the infrared emission. Now there's a lot of complications to know what's going on in the walls, what other species are there, you vary the pressure and things like that. But they came out with some pretty certain results that you know got published in Journal of Physical Chemistry and um, such journals. And that's, that's a spectrum there that you see that really does indicate that there's a lot of um, excitation of high vibrational levels because the one zero was down here. Th that may not be totally nascent, okay? Then Cirrus 1A came about, expensive uh, Michelson interferometer flown on the space shuttle, and that has a really nice instrument. Um, this upper plot shows you the signal to noise and is about, you can get about a factor of a thousand. This stuff down here is actually good, pretty good. So that showed non-equilibrium in the one-half spin orbit state and the three-halves. They weren't in equilibrium with the temp temperature. And you also saw high rotation, which first points out in these band heads. This is a blow up of this region. You see it a little bit on here. The J was up to 82 and a half for where the turnaround point, the vertex is. So those were very interesting things to try to, uh, to uh, understand, okay? So then, then another great part is the cooling rate of NO. And uh, Sabre has been looking at this for now, going on the 14th year. Some complications are, what do you really mean by the cooling rate? Uh, often in lower atmosphere in infrared, you're thinking of just your near, your near thermo, thermo, thermodynamic equilibrium, you're looking at collisions, and what escapes the space is cooling. Up, up in the upper atmosphere, you have a lot of exothermic reactions going on, and you can put those into the heat budget, but if you put all of that going into heat, it's not really true, because some of it goes into these vibrational levels that radiate and escape. The Sabre band was over here, mostly in the R branch of of the V equals one to zero, trying to get mostly that air glow component. But if you want to get the total cooling, you have to 
multiply by a factor of what all the rest of the bands do. And that's something that if you ever look into the Sabre data, they call an unfilter factor. But during solar storms, and one came about just a few months after Sab Time Sabre was launched, you could see the um, limb radiance went up by a large amount, by a factor of four. And if you look at the southern hemisphere um, radiated nitric oxide, it goes also up by close to factor four, but the storm conditions go off and it fairly quickly relaxes in the order of a day or two. So that's where Marty Malinchek got into this idea and posted a paper on the, the uh, thermostat. And so just as a closing slide here, um, you could look at the NO power versus in this almost 13 or so years, and it varies with the solar cycle on the long scale, on the shorter scale with probably the solar rotation periods, but very markedly so with the um, AP or geomagnetic conditions, particle conditions. So I'll, I'll end there and um, say that there's still more that could be done trying to get the best values for all these modeling constants for the reactions and putting it into some good 3D upper atmosphere model and seeing how well things actually agree. Thank you. Who has questions? Gary. Have there been comparisons of the IR NO densities and UV determined NO densities? And it's difficult to get the ground total NO uh, density from the IR because you're not measuring the ground state. You need a model with it or an absorption measurement. Um, and because the, the one to zero connection needs to know what the atomic oxygen is. If somebody would give you a great value of the atomic oxygen when you were measuring this, this one zero very prominent feature, you can probably get a good idea of what NO is and you know people have done that with ver various thing, various amounts and you know whether it really agrees right somewhat depends on what that NO plus O collision like citation rate is. Any other questions or comments? Okay, thank you.